Hi guys, how are you? Welcome back to my channel. For those of you visiting for the first time, hi, my name is Kai, and basically on this channel, I talk about all true crime cases that happen in the 808 state. I hope you guys can hear me okay. I feel like I'm talking loud. Um, it's been dumping rain here. We've been having um, thunder and lightning. So I'm gonna try my best and talk loud because I don't have a microphone. Um, before I get into today's case, I do have a couple reminders. Please remember that this video is strictly for entertainment purposes only. Um, I'm just the local girl trying to raise awareness, trying to give victims a voice. So please, please guys, don't come for me. And secondly, please remember to be kind in your comments. No hurt, no hate, no shade. Um, if you're going to leave a comment, just remember to be respectful and abide by YouTube's comment guidelines. <laughs> my cat. All right. Today's case um, piques my interest because it's been a case that is technically unsolved, but it is solved. And you'll, you'll see why I say that by the end of the video. Um, it's one of those cases where it's very frustrating because the, the suspect and the killer is like right there and it's so obvious that um, this person is the one that committed these crimes. But for some reason, um, you know, Honolulu Department, uh, Police Department at the time, whether it was forensics, technology, you know, timing, um, it did happen in 1985. Just for some reason, things did not align. And unfortunately, um, the results that were produced, in my opinion, you know, wasn't the results that should have happened. In other words, I don't think that these victims got justice. I don't think these families, these uh, families of these victims got justice. But again, that's just my opinion. My cat, this is my cat, Trixie. Again, every time I film, she's up here so I will be back <laughs> I'm gonna take care of her I'll be right back okay so today's case um, I'm gonna do it a little bit different and what I mean by that is that I'm going to start um, talking about the victims and sharing a little bit of a little bit of information on each victim and then I'm going to talk about the suspect so today's case took place in 1985 in Honolulu Hawaii and at this time, um, it became aware to the public and to Honolulu Police Department that there was a serial killer um, in Honolulu. And this serial killer was going around and targeting and you know murdering young, beautiful women. From what I've read, there are five known victims. And I say known because I don't know for certain and nobody knows for certain if that there were more um, murders before the known victims. So today's case takes place in 1985 in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm sure some of you have already heard about this case. Um, they call him, they call the killer, the Honolulu Strangler or the Honolulu Rapist and he got his nickname because all of his five victims were found strangled. Now I'm gonna talk about the victims first and then I'm going to talk about the killer. So the first victim, her name is Vicki Gail Purdy. She was originally from North Carolina and just 25 years old. She lived in Mililani at the time with her husband, Gary Purdy. Gary Purdy was an army helicopter pilot now she left to go clubbing in Waikiki with some of her friends on May 29, 1985. She was last seen by the cab driver who drove her to her car that was parked at the Shorebird Hotel at around 12 o'clock midnight. Now her car was later found in the hotel parking lot the next morning so she did not leave the parking lot that night with her car. Um, unfortunately, Vicky's body was found on an embankment in Keihi Lagoon the very next day. Um, she was wearing her yellow jumpsuit that she was wearing the night before when she went out clubbing. And she was found with her hands bound and tied behind her back. She was SA'd and she was strangled to death. Now, of all the five victims, um, Vicky is known to have the most outer injuries 
and she was strangled with ligature, you know, with something around her neck. And the medical examiner had said that she had the most injuries, which means that Vicky um, probably tried to fight back. So, and I know Vicky's husband had stated that Vicky was described as feisty. You know, she's really a tough cookie, someone who could hold her own. And I've read in a couple sources that she was kind of a taller girl, like six feet. Um, I could be wrong on that, but um, it would kind of explain, you know, why the husband would say, you know, she was a tough girl, big, um, not big as in fat, but just kind of, you know, big in stature and that she could handle her own. So that was Vicky. The second victim, her name is Regina Sakamoto, and she was just 17 years old. Regina was originally born in Kansas and she was actually from um, her mom's previous relationship, not from her stepdad. Her stepdad, is, his name is Maurice Sakamoto and that's how Regina got her, um, her last name Sakamoto. She took her step, stepdad's last name. Now, Regina was a high school senior at Lelihua and on January 14, 1986, she was living in Waipahu and was going to catch the bus from Waipahu to school, but unfortunately, she missed the bus. So she calls her boyfriend at around 7 or 7.15 a.m. that morning, you know, to let him know she, is, she had missed her bus and she's going to be late to school. But unfortunately, Regina was never seen in school. Um, she never made it to school. And, you know, Regina was just like any other teenager. She was planning to go to college in the fall. She had a younger brother named Omar. Um, and I, I heard she was very, like, she was extremely close with her mom. And unfortunately, Regina's body was found in Ke'ehi Lagoon um, on January 15, 1986. Now, Regina was found wearing a blue tank top a white sweatshirt and from her waist down she was unclothed and it was said that she too was um, found with her hands tied and bound behind her back she was you know s aid and she was strangled to death now an interesting interesting thing about um, Regina was that unlike the other victims she was found with an electrical cord tied to her foot and the other side was tied to some rocks. So she was found um, in the water, like Vicky. Vicky was also found in the water on an embankment, right? In Keihi Lagoon. Well, Regina was also found in Keihi Lagoon at a different spot, but she was um, found tied to some rocks, which means that the killer wanted her to be found. Um, obviously, he had tied her that way so she wouldn't you know, drift off and float away into the ocean. And, you know, for those of you that study serial killers and have had researched about serial killers, they do this because, yes, they want the body to be found. It's because they want to shock and they want to scare the community. Because now this is the second victim, right, that has died by this person's hands. So he wants to see the reaction of the public, you know. he It's a sense of control and it's a sense of power. Um, now, of course, like, any parent, you know, when Regina's family found out, you know, that she had been murdered, her brother Omar said that, you know, her family was just devastated. Now, she was super close with her mom, and uh, Regina's brother Omar said that, you know, his mom basically lost her mind after. I mean, can you imagine how devastating that is to have to go and identify the body, identify your daughter, and and the manner in which her life ended is just horrific. You know, it's very hard to grapple with that kind of information. You know, it puts somebody in shock and it traumatizes someone when they find out that their loved one, especially so young, she was only 17 years old. She wasn't even an adult, you know, um, taken in that kind of manner. So um, unfortunately, you know, Regina's mom lost her mind and she just, the family never fully recovered. Um, Omar said that his father has since passed away and his mother has end stage dementia. And to me, that is so sad. And I don't know if his mom is still alive, um, but to me, that's so sad because, you know, dementia, she's forgetting things. She's forgetting um, just 
parts, you know, in, in, things about her life. And so, you know, is it good that she forgot that her daughter was murdered or is it, you know, sad? It's just kind of like a catch-22, you know what I mean? It's like you don't want the mom to be in pain and keep remembering that because I don't think you ever get something, you don't, you don't ever get over something like that. Even though time, you know, it's been like 20 something years. This happened back in 1986. You just don't get over it. I mean, no way. There's no how. The third victim is Denise Hudges. Denise Hudges was just 21 years old and originally from Washington State. Her husband, Charles Hudges, was a Navy, uh, a sailor in the Navy. And so he was stationed in Hawaii. And you know, Denise, being the good wife that she is, followed her husband to Hawaii. So they had only been living in Hawaii for about five months when um, this tragic, you know, event happened. And at the time, Denise was working for a telephone company and she became, you know, a valuable employee right away. She was such a great worker and a lot of her co-workers described her as always smiling, always happy no matter what. She just had a great positive attitude. So on January 29th, Denise had gone to meet her husband Charles for dinner on the ship. And at around 10 o'clock p.m., Denise was heading home. And the next day, you know, Denise usually caught the bus to work. And the next day on January 30th, Denise didn't show up to work. And so, like I said, because she was such a valuable employee, a lot of her coworkers immediately, you know, noticed her missing and reported that she was missing. Unfortunately, on February 1st, three fishermen found Denise's body in Moanalua Stream. She was wearing a blue dress, and unlike the other victims, um, she was wrapped in a blue tarp. The killer had wrapped her in a blue tarp before disposing of her body. Like the other two victims, she was also um, essayed. She also had her hands tied and bound behind her back and she was strangled to death. So now three victims, you know, three young beautiful women found murdered, found strangled, found essayed, and found with their hands tied and bound behind their back. Obviously, this is the same person doing all of this. So HPD now knows that this is the works of a serial killer. And so they form a 27-person task force to basically, you know, profile the, ki profile the killer um, and try and solve this, this case. They figure that the killer is an opportunist who actually watches these victims without these victims knowing. And now... The similarities, right? Because Vicky was alone and in need of some kind of transportation. You know, she was dropped, being dropped off to her car. Regina Sakamoto was at the bus stop, again, in need of transportation, waiting to catch the bus to go to school. And Denise, she caught the bus to work also. Again, she probably was waiting at the bus stop, again, in need of transportation to get to work. And so all, a lot of these similarities told the task force that this guy, this killer, whoever he was, was watching these women. He knew that these women were at the bus stop and in a time of need, in a time of transportation. And it's interesting because this person either made himself known to these, to these women and so they, he was a familiar face and not threatening or he watched them and just kind of approached them, you know, just like out of the blue and maybe asked them if they needed a ride or something like that. Because you guys got to remember, this was back in 1985, right? It was different back then, you know, maybe catching a ride with a stranger wasn't, you know, such a like a, such like a, whoa, don't do that kind of thing. Such, such a big no-no back then. It was still 1985 and... You know, up until this point, Hawaii was relatively safe. The task force also concludes that the killer either lives or works in the area where the bodies are found, which is um, from Waipahu to Sand Island. So the fourth victim, her name is Luis Madaris. Luis Madaris was 25 years old, and Luis flew to Kauai because her mother had passed away, and she took a late-night flat 
flight back to Oahu on March 26 and you know told her family that she was going to catch the bus home at the airport from the airport she was never seen alive again now on April 2nd workers found Luisa's body um, decomposing in the Waikele stream and Luis was three months pregnant at this time and like the other victims um, Luis um, was naked from the waist down she too was essayed she too had her hands tied and bound behind her back and she too was strangled um, it's so sad because you know she was three months pregnant the fifth victim is Linda Pesk Pisk Piece. Linda was 36 years old and she's described as a person who loved adventure. She loved to dance. She was carefree. She was intelligent. She once hitch hitchhiked across US, um, the United States alone. And I believe she used to live in Guam for a while before she moved to Hawaii. Um, Linda was last seen alive on the morning of April 29, 1986 by her roommate. She was supposed to return home late that night due to a work meeting, but she never did. Linda's car was found parked at the Nimitz and H1 viaduct. Her roommate reported, um, her, roommate reported her missing. So this is where the case gets interesting. A man by the name of Howard Gay contacts police and tells them that a psychic told him there's a body that could be found on Sand Island. So the Honolulu Police Department, of course, they're going to entertain this idea, right? So they meet, you know, they tell Howard, okay, you know, show us where, where the body is. So Howard takes the police to an exact location on Sand Island, but there is no body there. Now, as um, the police are there with Howard, there's a couple that's walking by and, you know, they're collecting cans and bottles to recycle. And they stumble upon a woman's nude body. And this woman is identified as Linda Pesk. The other victims, Linda too was found nude, essayed, hands tied and bound behind her back, and strangled. Uh, at the time, Linda had a seven-year-old daughter. So after Linda's death, Honolulu Police Department, they start to set up roadblocks on, you know, Sand Island, Keihi Lagoon, and they start to ask the frequent commuters, you know, questions, have you guys seen anything? And witnesses say that they've seen a light-colored van, um, you know, around the area, and they, they say they also saw a Caucasian man driving Linda Pesky Pesky's car the night that she disappeared. So HPD sent, um, they start to send some female officers undercover to the Honolulu International Airport and to Keihi Lagoon. So, right, so they're doing like a sting operation, sending some female officers, probably the younger ones, undercover to see if um, they can catch this killer. So who is this Howard Gay? Who is this guy? Um, Howard Gay, Howard Andrew Gay, was born in Buffalo, New York on January 1st, 1943. Howard lived in Apple Valley, California for about 15 years and he was in the military for a while being stationed over at George Air Force Base until he was uh, discharged honorably in 1965. In 1968, Howard was employed by Flying Tiger Lines at LAX. And this is how actually Howard um, eventually comes to Hawaii. So Flying Tiger Lines, he's working for them in LAX. And they eventually transfer, transfer Howard to Hawaii so that he can work in Hawaii. So Howard would train air aircraft mechanics on air airframe and power plant systems on large cargo planes. So this guy was pretty smart when it came to, you know, mechanics and aviation. And they bring in, so they bring in Howard for questioning. And at the time, the homicide detective, I think his name was Lou Souza. Lou Souza was the lead um, detective on the task force. And Lou said that when they bring him in, he has all, you know, 
all the guilty negative signs, right? He doesn't make eye contact when they ask him questions. He crosses his hands across his chest. You know, his body language is just closed off. So um, they ask him to take a polygraph test. And surprisingly, Howard does. Howard takes the polygraph test and he fails. But eventually, HPD let them go. Let him go. Howard's ex-wife, Rita, and Howard's girlfriend both describe Howard as a smooth talker. They both say, and this is so crazy, they both say that he used to like to tie them up and have sex with them while their hands are bound behind their back. Um, his girlfriend claimed that on the nights of the murders is when uh, she and Howard would get into arguments and Howard would end up leaving and not come home until you know either the next day or very late. So at the time of the murders, Howard Gay was living in Eva Beach and he worked on Lagoon Drive, right? Because he worked at the Flying Tiger Lines and um, all of the flight schools and everything with aviation, they're pretty much on Lagoon Drive. So he worked on Lagoon Drive. He, looked, he worked in that area, right, where all these uh, murders were taking place. And he basically worked from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. In 1986, one of Howard's sons, I think it was Jason Gay, ended up getting killed while he was changing a tire on the side of the road. And this death, the death of his son, this brings Howard into a spiritual path to be a reborn Christian. So Howard ends up moving back to California sometime in 1986 after his son passes away. And when Howard moves back to California, this is when the killings stop. The FBI and Honolulu Police Department, they keep an eye, they keep a close eye on Howard when he moves, right? They don't have enough evidence after talking to the prosecution's office, they don't have enough evidence to charge Howard, you know, with these crimes beyond a reasonable doubt. All of the evidence that they have at that time was circumstantial. Now you gotta remember, at that time, back in 1985, they did not have DNA, right? They didn't have any kind of advanced technology that they do have today. So, Although Honolulu Police Department and the FBI, you know, they knew, they had a gut feeling that Howard was the killer, Howard, Howard was the Honolulu Strangler, all signs pointed to him. Unfortunately, when they brought it to the prosecutor's office, I think it was Peter Carlisle at the time, they said that they don't have enough evidence to, to charge him with murder. It's just all circumstantial murder. And now to bring a case to trial, you know, you only have one shot at it, and it has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to be able to have all the jurors in there say, this man is guilty 110%, beyond a reasonable doubt. I have no doubt in my mind that this is the killer. And now, you know, yeah, you can say, well, he liked to tie up his ex-girlfriend and his ex-wife, you know, with their hands behind their back and have sex with them. So it doesn't mean that he's a killer. You know, just because all the, the victims were found that way. You know, you and I, we know that yes, he was the killer. He is the Honolulu Strangler. Howard Gay is the Honolulu Strangler. When Howard moves to California in 1986, the killing stopped. Nobody else, none of, no other young woman, you know, found, like these other victims were found, was ever killed again. So, when he moves back to California, the FBI and, you know, the police department, they do keep a close eye on him. You know, just because he moved um, out of Hawaii, it doesn't mean he's off the radar. One thing that was so interesting to me, and this might be, I mean, this might sound like a small information, but it, it's actually super big. Um, when they were doing the autopsies on these five victims, they found semen in, these, in the women, okay, because they were essayed but it was very little semen. And that is said to be because the killer had a vasectomy. That is why there is little to none semen found in these women, okay? So it sounds like he didn't use protection. And so they find semen in all these women, right? They do the exam, they find semen, but there was very little sperm in there. So they say this person had a vasectomy. 
and that totally narrows down the pool of suspects, right? Now you're not just looking at a whole bunch of people, anybody, you know, that can have kids. You're looking at men that have had vasectomies. So the pool is like smaller. And guess what, guys? Guess what? Howard Gay had a vasectomy. So right, now, and then you can say, well, that's evidence, that's proof, you know, that's not proof, that's still not his DNA. There could be another person named Peter that had a vasectomy, right? And like to tie up his girlfriends and his ex-wives with their hands tied behind their back. It's all circumstantial. And like I said, even though present day, 2021, we know that Howard Gay was the Honolulu Strangler, at that time, they didn't have the resources like we do today. And that's, that's so unfortunate. Unfortunately, I guess I shouldn't say unfortunately. I say unfortunately because the victims and the victims' families did not get justice. I would have liked to see Howard Gay spend the rest of his life in jail, but Howard Gay died in 2003 from kidney failure. He died, I think, 60 years old. So, I mean, it's kind of good, right? He died at such a young age, at 60. That's super young. Uh, one can only hope that it was a slow, painful, very, very painful death. Um, but I say unfortunate because, like I said, you know, couldn't ever bring him to trial. I mean, if he was alive present day, you would probably get the DNA off of him and then off of the victims and then you can, you know, bring him to trial. But like I said, it was a different time. So, technically, the Honolulu Strangler case is unsolved because you can't charge a dead guy with murder part of me kind of wish they would have exhumed his body i mean i don't know if he was buried in a cemetery or if he was cremated and his ashes were spread somewhere but say he was buried i mean wouldn't that be great if you could exhume his body and test his dna oh wait oh my gosh i just thought about this he still has a living a living son only one son passed away you could test that son's DNA and cross-check that with the DNA that was found on the victims. Wow. It would be great if you could still charge him with murder. You know what I mean? Even though he's passed away. But now they do like all these 23andMe and Ancestry and that's how they're finding all these serial killers. All these cases that have been, have been unsolved for years. DNA. They can even test your family member, test the serial killer's family member, and somehow get that back to the serial killer. And I'm so glad that technology is advanced in that way today because a lot of cases have been being solved. I've seen this um, go on. So why not, just putting it out there, why not test the DNA of that son that is alive? Can't you subpoena him or something? I don't know. Test him, test it against the, the victims. I know they kept the, the evidence, you know, of the five victims. I bet you, I bet you there is a connection to Howard Gay. I bet you. I mean, just my opinion. Don't come for me. Anyways, let me know what you guys think about the case, how it was handled, anything, anything, any kind of comments, you know. Um, I'm getting all stuffy all of a sudden. As I was doing videoing this, I'm like getting stuffy and like I can't breathe and stuff. So I apologize if I was like going this, going down on the video. But it could be the weather here. Like I said, it's been dumping rain. We had a lot of thunder and lightning. So I, I'm sure it's that. It's the weather because I'm getting pretty stuffy. So I'm going to go take some sinus medicine. Anyways, thanks for watching, you guys. Um, I hope to see you next week. Aloha. <laughs>